this tells you everything you need to know. Right. The Odeon for the first time since Dread, and we're going to be watching the second cinematic release of The Amazing Spider-Man, number five, if we're going by the previous series. Andrew Garfield is back as Peter Parker and Spider-Man. We get Jamie Foxx as Electro and Max Dillon, so that should be intriguing. And we got Emma Stone, the good female interest. Sorry, Kirsten Dunn, but you suck. And... Dane DeHaan as... Harry Osborn, and when you look at him and compare it to the previous series, it's like Tobey Maguire and James Franco swap roles, in essence. Some people have slated this movie already, but then again, people like to, you know, eat shit up and not look at things positively. I'm different than that. In 142 minutes, will this be as good as the last Spider-Man 2? We're gonna find out. Well, I've just come back having to survive the in the April showers here in England. And we'll just dive into my review, because I didn't have time to do a mini-review because weather. So yeah, let's start with story. This was not as a as such a well-oiled machine as opposed to the previous Mark Webb movie. Now, the first movie had its problems, I will... I will concede that, but this one... It had a problem with consistency. It seemed to have a problem not focusing on one element of the story for too long, and it just sort of keeps jumping back and forth um, all the time, rather than staying on one specific plot item for, say, maybe 10 minutes, and then go to the next one. But as far as sequels go, it's not a badly written uh, sequel. I still think Spider-Man 2, in retrospect now, is a better sequel to, the, to its original movie. This one... I kind of got the feeling they kind of went for a little more style than substance, if that means anything to you. The man himself, Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Well, he's much more comedic, much more witty in this one. I felt that... They gave a lot of um, really decent material for Andrew to work with because in this one, and I'm not, and I don't like having to keep you know using Christopher Daniel Barnes as an example, but you listen to his delivery as both Parker and Spidey, and the guy delivers it in spades, and equally so with this, Andrew Garfield is such a good. Uh, comedic actor with the way he just delivers his jokes on screen but he does the dramatic side really well in the sense of you actually do feel the guy's emotion um, which is something I felt Tobey Maguire was just so wooden with whereas with Andrew there's genuine life there's genuine energy to his character absolute sweetheart. She is the best love interest that I've seen for Spider-Man in a long time on the silver screen. I keep saying it, Kirsten Dunst is terrible. If you like Kirsten Dunst, that's fine. But for me, that girl's acting got worse with both sequels. In, in Spider-Man 1, okay, passable, but by the time Spider-Man 2 finished, I'm like, come on, can we stop? But here, she's very forthright, very forthright, excuse me, um, very direct, and she doesn't take any nonsense from Peter, as Peter at times tends to be you know, I think we should be together, I don't think we should be together, I really want you, I don't want you to get hurt. In some degree, you can sort of sympathise with his position, because if people knew who he actually was, then 
it just opens up a Pandora's box of all kinds of problems for him. Sally Field as Aunt May, she was heavily played down in this movie, and that's a strike against the movie already, because Sally Field is such a talented, um, well-established actress. When you consider some of her roles, like I say, in Mrs. Doubtfire and Smokey and the Bandit, here, although she does have a an impact on how Peter goes about his decision making and how he longs for the answers that he's been searching for at the same time her screenplay her screen time is greatly diminished and i don't like that well first off i think this guy's a better actor than james franco as harry but no disrespect to james franco he's a very very good actor but, it all comes back to the material that he was given in the three, the last three uh, Spider-Man movies before this series kicked in. And at times I just felt Franco could be wooden, whereas Dane, you get the sense there's bitterness bubbling beneath his skin. There's anger. There's, you know, he feels like he's been cheated and mistreated. And, to a subtle degree, you can sort of sympathise with him a little bit. His version of the Goblin... Um, how to best describe this? The look does look a little bit more gothic, a little bit more ghastly, a little bit more monster kind of looking. Because I think the what they went with in Spider-Man 1 in regards to Worm Defoe, they wanted the look to be... He's definitely had a transformation in terms of the toned muscles, but it was the psychology that they played on a lot more. Here, there's maybe like an, a little bit of that played in, but it's more of the physical manifestation when uh, Harry injects himself with the, with the spider venom that's actually held within Oscorp. I'm not going to go into too many details of the... The actual transformation but it does make it seem more like a I don't want to say monster movie but there's definitely elements of him becoming not human if that makes any sense to you and this is possibly the scariest goblin look uh, I've seen in a while and that's notwithstanding um, on the new goblin look that James Franco had um, not necessarily I wasn't scary, but it was just a sense of, really? That's what you're going with? Hey. Jamie Foxx played down the kind of, I don't want to say pathetic, because the way that Max had been treated up to that point, you know, people basically just don't give a crap about him. He plays it well. He feels like he's kind of worthless. He feels like he's, you know, mistreated. And he does really use that well. But then again, this is an established Academy Award winning actor, considering he did um, the biopic movie on Ray Charles. Awesome movie, by the way. Here he plays, like I say, the kind of pathetic, the, the kind of mistreated angle well. But then there's this vengeful side, this very sort of angered and embittered side when he's Electro. And the visual effects that he has when you see he's basically nothing more than living electricity. Uh, I gotta hand it to the visual, def visual effects department with uh, Columbia Pictures because 10 years ago, I don't think you could have made that look as good as it was. It might have been okay, but, you know, you see the leaps and bounds that visual effects have come along since then, so his performance was definitely well above board, so yeah, he gets a... Uh, he definitely gets a thumbs up from me on that one.
Felicity Jones as Felicia. Just Felicia. Not Felicia Hardy. Just Felicia. Um, she was basically on there for a cup of coffee. Nothing more. You know, this is a character who is, you know, is well known amongst the, the comic book Marvel Universe when she later becomes the Black Cat and she's reduced to nothing to... She's reduced to less than a secondary character. It's like, you know, come in, have a cup of coffee, there's my paycheck, bada bing, bada boom, gone. No. And we get Paul Giamatti as the Rhino. Do I really need to go into this? If I must. Alright. Poor. If I'm gonna be honest, that was poor. You know, I can I can understand the the angle of not being able to do a guy in a rhino costume and not be able to make it look believable because in comic books you pretty much have how should I put this? No boundaries or no set limits for what you can do because comic books are meant to be an escape from reality. And I think in the sense that if you try to do similar to what they did with Spider-Man the Animated Series where he's basically a guy sealed in a bulky muscular rhino costume, it wouldn't be as believable today. So the idea of what is being dubbed as the Rhino Thunderzords. I know there's going to be some people later this year that are going to be asking me to do a Power Rangers joke when I do Countdown to Christmas. If we're going to look at it realistically, um, or objectively even, this is probably the best that they could have done for the Rhino, but at the same time, you kind of look at it and you think, uh, no. No. Visual effects wise, probably the best I've seen in a Spider-Man movie for a while. You definitely get the sense that the whenever CG was used in this, it definitely conveyed the sense of of much more photorealism. Uh, particularly whenever Spidey's web swinging through the city, and this time, because obviously it's obviously a year or two removed since the last movie. He has a much better handle on how to actually web swing more effectively, so that was good. The costume looked a little truer or much more faithful to the comic books. I mean, I didn't have a problem with the, the costume from the last movie, but there was obviously an outcry from the fans and whatnot, and they just wanted something a little closer. And a lot of people have said that it looks too much like the the original Spider-Man suit from Spider-Man in 2002, but to be honest with you, there is only so much differences and alterations you can make to that costume to make it something new. I mean, all Mark Webb and his team have done with designers is to do their own variation, because if you... I mean, I like the idea that they've gone back to something a little bit more faithful to the comic books, but at the same time, they've tried to do their own spin on it, because, you know, what's the point in, in doing something new if you're just going to re repeat the same design from 12 years ago? Just saying. This is not down in the levels of Spider-Man 3 when it comes to the pacing and the writing. Because Spider-Man 3 was... It started out promisingly, but I got the sense that they were just trying to cram too much. This one... Not as good as Spider-Man 2. I think this one probably sits, like, maybe... Say... If I gave the last one a must, this one is just a very modest, good flick bargain. 
Only on the basis that... It's hard to say. Because it was kind of all over the place. In... With the pacing, the writing, and the direction. I mean, the acting, as I've said before, is fine. You know, you've got some of the most talented actors in the world on this. And Andrew Garfield is just a treat to watch. I mean, he's basically his generation of Robert Downey Jr. and of. But there were some twists and turns that I didn't expect to see happen. But let's just say some characters won't be coming back for Amazing Spider-Man 3. And the thing is, even if Amazing Spider-Man 2 does not do that well, they're still going to make another one. Because people will go to the fix to watch this one. But I honestly enjoyed it. I didn't think it was as good as Amazing Spider-Man 1, but my opinion, take it for what you will, as it is. So, like I said a few, moment, a few moments ago, I'm just going to give this a very modest good flick bargain. It's, it's not great, it's not awful, it's just... It's just okay. Take that for what you will. Well then, until next time when I go to see Godzilla, thank you for watching.